brothers and sisters in Islam, this month was the month in which the Sahaba and the Salaf they will ask Allah Azza wa Jal previously for a while as it has been narrated authentically that they will ask for six months prior that Allah Azza wa lets them live towards Ramadan. Six months ahead. And that Allah Azza wa gives gives them with the blessing of witnessing Ramadan. And then they'll ask Allah Azza wa for another period after it in order for Allah Azza wa to accept their Ramadan. So the whole year was revolved around it. Asking to reach it and asking to accept it. And from the dua is that, Oh Allah, Masalimni ila Ramadan. Oh Allah, Azzawajal, deliver me and make me safe to Ramadan. And deliver Ramadan to me, meaning make me of those who are able to worship you correctly in it. And accept it from me and take it from me as an accepted deed. My dear brothers, this month of Ramadan is the month in which many of the great blessings happened in it. From these great blessings is that Allah Azza wa Jal, He chose it to be the month in which the Qur'an was sent down. The Qur'an had three revelations, three descendings, as Ibn Abbas has narrated in the authentic hadith that's collected by Al-Haq. And that is that the Qur'an had three revelations. One from Allah Azza wa Jal to the protected tablet, Lohim Mahfur. And then the other one was to the lowest heaven, Bayt al And then the third one was from Allah to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in stages. Now, the one from the Lohim Mahfur down to Bayt al happened in a month of Ramadan. And also Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam received his first revelation in Ramadan. And we know, my dear brothers, how this month was chosen out of all months. Why? Due to its greatness, due to its significance. Also, my dear brothers, this month of Ramadan is the month in which Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, مَنْ صَامَ رَمَضَانَ إِيمَانًا وَحْتِسَابًا ظُفِرَ لَهُ مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِنْ ذَلْ To never fast Ramadan with belief and taking into account the reward Whatever he has done from his previous sins will be forgiven. The month of Ramadan, dear brothers, is the month where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, وَلِلَّهِ أُتَقَاءُ فِي رَمَضَانِ وَذَلِكَ فِي كُلِّ لَيْلًا And Allah has has people who will be protected from the fire, who will be safeguarded, who will be saved from the fire. And that happens in every night. The month of Ramadan, my dear brothers, is the month of blessings, and there are times in it which you have the angels in it making dua for you. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he said, Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala al-mutasahirin. Verily Allah and His angels make salah upon the person who is doing his suhoor, and that is the supplement we have before Fajr, and that is the one we take in order for us, for us to implement the sunnah and also to be able to fast the day. And here the salah means. From Allah Azza wa Jal, mercy and forgiveness. And when, it's, when we're talking about the angels, it's their dua for Allah Azza wa Jal for you. Their dua for you. So this is the blessings that Allah Azza wa Jal tells us about. And also in the authentic hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, مَنْ خُتِمَ لَهُ بِصِيَامِ يَوْمِ دَخَلَ الْجَنَّةِ Authentic hadith, collected by Imam Ahmad. He said, whoever Allah Azza wa Jal takes his life while he's fasting, he will enter paradise. Of course, take into consideration, if someone who was not leaving the major obligations, such as also prayer and so on, otherwise this person, may Allah have mercy on yani, all of us, what's going to happen to him? It's a very dangerous situation. But the point is, this is from the virtues of Ramadan. And that is, the person who dies while he's fasting, he will enter paradise. Also in another hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that he never pass a day in the cause of Allah azza wa jal. That Allah azza wa jal will distance him away from the fire like what's between the heavens and the earth. 
And of course, in the cause of Allah, was explained by scholars to me while in a state of fighting in the cause of Allah. But others included it to me all types of fasting. And the most correct is the one that's speaking about in the cause of Allah that's fighting, that they are fasting at the same time. But it's from the virtues of fasting, my dear brothers. Fasting had a great position in the life of the pious predecessors that they will ask Allah not to take their life except while they are fasting. It is reported that Ibrahim ibn Hadi, he was fasting when the angel of death approached him to take his life. And he told his son, Oh my son, bring me a glass of water. So his son rushed to get him water. And then the father took the cup and he raised it to his mouth. And he said, has the sun set? Did the sun set? He said, no. Then he put it back. And the son was begging his father, oh father, drink, drink. And he got into a state of remembering Allah, so he read reading Quran, until he got to a beautiful verse where he recited, For the likeness of this, let the workers work. And he died up. Hey Allah, my brothers, for the likeness of this, let everyone ask Allah The likeness of this day, while you are in a state of obedience to Allah and while you are in a state of worship. Also, it is reported that from the pious woman, she was also approached by the angel of death while she was fasting. And she her, her children went to bring her water. And they asked their mother, Oh mother, please break your fast. Oh, oh mother, please break your fast. Her name was the Fisa bin Hassan. She was fasting. And they said, Oh mother, please take this water. Please drink it. She turns around and she says, Woe to you. Woe to you. It's a wonder. It's a wonder what you are asking me to do. I ask Allah for 30 years not to take my life except while I am fasting. And now that Allah has gifted me with this, you want to deprive me of it? And then she got into a state of remembering Allah and reciting the Quran until she got to a verse and she died after it. And this verse is, the verse from Allah is when he says, قُلْ لِمَنْ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ قُلْ لِلَّهِ كَتَبَ عَلَى نَفْسِهِ الرَّحْمَةِ She recited, Say to whom does all that which is in the heavens and the earth belong to? Allah Azza wa Jalla says, Say to Allah, He has written it upon Himself to have mercy. Of course, on those who deserve the mercy of Allah Azza. May Allah will make it for And then she died after this. But look at this beautiful ending while she was fasting. This is the state of the Salaf, the pious predecessors, and their love to fast and their attachment to it. Ibn Umar, when he was approached by the angel of death, he was asked the question, what do you... Well, he said, I don't regret from my life except three things. SubhanAllah, three things that he regretted from his life. If you were to be asked today, what do you regret from your life? Probably one might say, I wish I bought that house at the time when it was very cheap, because today it's worth a million dollars. Or probably, I wish I got that job, because I know if I would have got it, I would have been rich. And all these different types of hallucinations that people get up to. But he was asked this question, and he said, I regret three things. Well, he was saying, I regret three things. One of them is not fasting on the hot, hot days. So Yamun Hawajir. So Yamun Hawajir. The fasting of the hot days. And the, the, uh, the, the second one was, or well, the first one, this was the second. The first was not praying longer. And the third one, not fighting the, fight, not fighting the transgressors. And he meant by that a judge. Point is, look at how he looked at it. This was the state 
of the pious predecessors. They were described by the character of fasting. It is reported that Rasulullah once divorced his wife, Hafsa. And Allah sends down to him, and this is reported by Bukhari, he sends down to him at the angel of Jibreel, saying, <coughs> Jibreel was saying to him, that Allah orders you to return her. Allah orders you to return her. Because she is a sawwama awwam. Why? Because she is someone who fasts a lot, prays a lot at night. And Allah said, says to me to tell Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about this. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam kept her, and he did not release her. This was their description on how they were. My dear brothers, fasting had a very great position in their lives. Ramadan had a great position in their lives because they realized what it's all about. They realized so many great virtues about Ramadan, which I have only mentioned a little bit of the many that have been reported about it, either directly through the hadith or that which is derived from the understanding of text generally. It's not directly mentioned, but it's derived from the understanding. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, all this introduction to the topic, we can't get into the topic of brotherhood and mercy unless we talk about the month of Ramadan from its virtues, what it's all about, this beautiful month. Why, did, why is it that Allah ordered us to fast? Why is it that Allah said, A soul will need what I may receive in Fasting is for me, and I am the one who will reward for it, meaning it's upon me to reward for it. He did not specify the reward of it. He did not specify exactly how much ajr are you getting. He said, Asaw muni, wa ala Fasting is for me, and it's upon me, and I will reward for it. Why is it that Allah Azza wa commanded us to do this great, great obligation? Is it simply for us to be starving, and to be thirsty, and to be weak? Or is it really to train the body uh, so that we can become you know, of those who break the routine, what is it? The answer is found in the Qur'an where Allah has <coughs> the He says to us, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu kutiba alaykum usiyam kutiba alaykum usiyam kama kutiba alal ladheena min qablikum la'allakum la'allakum tattafu Are you believe? Fasting has been prescribed for you as it has been prescribed to the people before you. Meaning it's a must, just like it was on the people before you, it's a must upon you. Why? That you can gain taqwa, piety. Taqwa, my dear brothers, is to be conscious of Allah, to be mindful of Allah, it's to be of those who protect themselves from the, from the anger of Allah, from the punishment of Allah. It's to be of those who constantly remember Allah by doing what He commanded and leaving what He has prohibited and by preparing for the day of resurrection. But the question that is a that, can, that will rise, why is it that Suyam will make you achieve taqwa? Why is it that suyam, fasting, will make you achieve taqwa if you've done it right, in the correct way? The answer is, in this obligation, or firstly, because this is the command of Allah Azza wa Jal. And everything that Allah Azza wa Jal commands you to do, by you fulfilling it, you are coming closer to Allah Azza wa Jal. And your iman is increasing. Your iman, your belief, is increasing. Iman increases and decreases. It increases with acts of goodness and righteousness and obedience and it decreases, it goes down your iman, goes lower and weaker with acts of disobedience and by you not doing the obligations. And by not being consistent with it and, and increasing from the options. Now, firstly, so you will increase your taqwa because it's a command. And by you doing so, you are strengthening your iman. Secondly, 
Because in this act of worship, you are training yourself to leave what is normally halal, to leave what is normally allowed, food and drink, and intercourse with, with, with the spouses. These three things are normally halal. By you leaving what is normally halal, you have trained yourself to be of those who are capable of leaving what is haram. And this is why Rasulullah sallam, he tells us that مَنْ لَمْ يَدْعَ قَوْلَ الزُّونِ وَنْعَمَلَ بِهِ وَنْعَمَلَ بِهِ فَلَيْسَ لِلَّهِ حَاجَةٌ أَنْ يَدْعَ أَنْ يَدْعَ طَعَامَهُ وَشَرَابَهُ Whoever does not leave speaking of falsehood and acting falsehood, then Allah Azzawajal does not need him to go and leave his food and drink. Why? Because he's not understood this person, what's the purpose behind fasting? So by fasting, my dear brother and sister in Islam, you have trained yourself and proved it to yourself that you are capable of doing things. When you are capable of doing, doing leaving what is normally halal, you are definitely capable of leaving what is haram. And the next qiyam is what it does to you. It proves it. My dear, my dear respected brothers and sisters in Islam, the question that I would like to raise now, what taqwa, what piety, has the person who broke his fasting, and do, do not consider me of those who want to bash you. I love you and I want to speak to you when I really feel that's important. What, what, what taqwa, what piety has the person gained when he's left all day food and drink, but he still finds himself swearing? What piety has he gained? He left what is normally halal, but he did not leave what is always halal. Speaking of falsehood, and doing a falsehood. What piety, what taqwa has the person gained when he is fasting from the food and drink? Yes, subhanAllah, his eyes are not fasting from the haram. What taqwa has the person gained when he refrained from eating and drinking the, the halal, but he found it very easy to consume the haram wealth? What taqwa did he gain? What taqwa did this person gain? who broke his fast after a long day on a cigarette. What the He's proved it to himself all day that he is capable of leaving food and drink and cigarettes. How did this taqwa affect him when he is still weak to a stick? And I say this with a feeling of mercy towards my brothers and with a feeling of love to them. That's why I'm saying this. What that, what feeling, what that what, what piety has the person gained when he refrains all day from food and drink, but he does not pray. He does not pray altogether, or probably he doesn't pray on time. We need to reflect and understand, my dear brothers, the purposes behind fasting, and that is to gain them. From the great fruits of Ramadan, from the great blessings of Ramadan, and Wallah al it has this effect that could be almost described as magic. And I mean by this the halal and out, yani change. I don't mean by this the spell and for the all this haram. But could be almost described as magic. Overnight is the fruits of fasting. Overnight, overnight, you find a mosque packed out with people to do the tarawih. Almost a magical effect, except that it's not a magical effect, it is the heart changing overnight, wanting to make a move towards Allah. From the fruits of fasting is that people unite, people get together, people stand together, people worship Allah together. This is from the great things that Ramadan carries from gifts and blessings. Yes, Ramadan comes with gifts and blessings. And it comes with gifts. And one of them is this beautiful, beautiful concept of unity for the Muslims. Where the Muslims overnight, and you watch what I'm saying, and you've probably seen it before me. You watch the night just before Ramadan, in the night of Ramadan, you come to a mosque or a prayer hall, and it's as if it's Friday. It's as if it's Friday. People are all lined up, 
and ready to pray not only the obligations, but to pray after the obligations, whatever Allah has decreed for the Imam to pray. This is a sign, my dear brother, and my dear sisters in Islam. This is a sign that if we are truthful and we really want to come closer to Allah, that we can achieve quick results. It's a sign. Think about it to yourself, my brothers and sisters in Islam. Think about it. How could such a change happen if it's not to be taken as a sign? This is a sign that we can be of those who can establish brotherhood inside Ramadan and outside Ramadan. From the great lessons, from the great fruits that Ramadan carries, is that it tends to prove to you, my dear brother, and sister in Islam, it proves to you that you can do it. It proves to you that you can do it. When I say that you get together on the first night, it proves that you can get together on every single night and throughout the year to be of those who stand in straight lines. And this is something that we need to reflect on and ponder on. Ramadan, my dear respected brothers and sisters in Islam, is the month in which it comes as a stop station for all of us. A stop station. You've been on those long journeys by car and you find that resting place where, and a lot of the times you find a big board or big billboard that's got stop, revive and survive. Ramadan is your stop, revive and survive. It's that stopping station for the individual to come closer to his Lord and for the, for the community collectively, for the Muslims collectively altogether. It's a stop, revive, and, and survive station that we all need to take our share from it. Because if in Ramadan, in Ramadan we do not benefit, and in Ramadan we do not change, then when will we change? If in Ramadan we're not going to be of those who have that one, then when is it going to happen? I'm not saying it to you to despair, but the question is really, if we're not going to be of those who have a good change in Ramadan, then when is it that this, this is going to happen to us? When would this happen? And this is why one of the ulama, he said, if you're, not, if you're not forgiven in Ramadan, then when will you be forgiven? When will you be forgiven if you're not forgiven in Ramadan? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he got up onto the meat by us. And every step he took, he was saying, Ameen, Ameen, Ameen. Companions asked him later on. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, from the things that happened is that Jibreel made a dua. And he was saying, Ameen to it. And one of the duas that Jibreel was making is that may he be humiliated. The one who Ramadan enters and leaves and his sins have not been forgiven. Let it be humiliated. Rabbi ma'alfu. In his nose, let it be rubbed. Let it be humiliated. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Ameen. And this is an indication, brothers, that if we're not going to take advantage of it then, then when will we take advantage of it? Individually and collectively. Ramadan, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, is the month of brotherhood. It is the month of brotherhood. From the signs that it's the month of brotherhood, is that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he gave us the command collectively. He gave us the command collectively as Muslims. He said, Sumu li ru'yati wa aftiru li ru'yati. Fast the month of Ramadan when you see the crescent, when you see it. And break it, meaning have the eid when you see it. And he said it collectively, Sumu indicating to the community, to the Muslims, to the brothers, collectively. From the signs that Ramadan comes to establish and strengthen the ties of brotherhood, is it comes as a reminder for you 
towards your core Muslim brother and sister, no matter where, where they are in the world. You are now, my dear brother and sister in Islam, leaving that which you live in voluntarily. You're leaving something because you, because you choose to, which others don't leave it because they choose to, because they don't have it altogether. That is food and drink. When you are leaving this, you're experiencing, you're feeling what the poor person feels around the world. Isn't this to show you or show you how it strengthens brotherhood? And Rasulullah وسلم, he teaches us that he is not one of us. He is not one of us. The one who sleeps full at night while his neighbor is hungry. Why? Because this person is not thinking of the pain of his Muslim brother. And in Ramadan, you are forced to think about it. You will remember whether you like it or not. Why? Because actually you're going through the hunger now. You're going through the striving. You go through it from dawn till sunset. Just remember others go through it even longer than that because they don't have anything to break their fast. But the point is, you can see how Ramadan strengthens the brotherhood by making you feel what your Muslim brothers and sisters around the world feel. That's another sign that Ramadan comes to strengthen the ties of brotherhood. From the signs also that it comes all this is that Rasulullah he tells us about the person who prays with the Imam until he finishes. Whoever prays with the Imam until he finishes, then it will be written for him as if he stayed up the whole night. Whoever, authentic hadith, whoever stays with the Imam until he leaves, he finishes, it will be written as if he had prayed the whole night. من صلى مع الإمام حتى ينصرف كتب له كقيام ليلة. Now my brothers, praying with the Imam is it this prayer in Jama'ah? Yes, it is. And is it this brotherhood strengthened? And Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم mentioned here he prayed with prayers with the Imam. And we can see how Umar bin Khattab رضي الله عنه he had this done in congregation the taraweeh the prayer of the night together. Why? in order for people to have this bonding together, where they are united in their worship. Reflect and think with me, my dear brother and sister in Islam. You are thinking about your brother and remembering your brother and sister when you're hungry. You're remembering your brother and sister at the time of worship. And this is, subhanAllah, a combination of the greatest of that which is in your life. Your sustenance and your worship. Your sustenance, your provisions, what you eat and drink, and your worship. One is the food for the body, and the other one is the food for your soul. And you, with these two together, the food for the body, and food for your soul in Ramadan, you are remembering your brothers and bonding with your brothers. You are bonding with your brothers. Also from the signs that Ramadan is the month of brotherhood. And it should not be that we only call Ramadan the month of brotherhood. A brotherhood is not something short term. We put it on and off like a fuse. Ramadan is an example, but it should not be limited to it. Just remember this, I'm not speaking that only Ramadan is like this. Otherwise, with all my respect, we're all fake. We are all fake if we're going to only be brothers during Ramadan and remember each other in Ramadan. Otherwise, we're all fake. We're not real brothers. Because real brotherhood is a brotherhood that lasts during, before and after. This is real brother, brotherhood. Verily, the believers are not but brothers. And I'm only mentioning how Ramadan is of course why it strengthens and it gets better and better. Okay? From the signs that Ramadan is the month that comes to strengthen the brotherhood is the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The one who breaks the fast of the fasting person, he will get the reward of his fasting, except that he will not lose his reward. 
Isn't this a sign of brotherhood? When you are sharing with your brother, when you are aiding your brother, when you're giving your brother, not because you want something in return in wealth, but because you want to be of those who gain the reward for doing so. The month of Ramadan is the month of brotherhood, my dear brothers and sisters. And so is the whole year. But Ramadan carries the great examples. In Ramadan, even the person who went lost and astray, you find that he comes back. He comes back to his master. You find an incredible meeting in Ramadan. An incredible meeting. And Allah, every year that passes, I find myself in a, in a state of spiritual joy and great happiness. You see these brothers walking through the door who have rallies, wearing their singlets, tattooed, earrings, chains, coming to pray. <coughs> Wallahi al-Azim, it's as if I've broken my fast again. You know the joy that you get when you break your fast? Rasulullah he said, Beside him, you've got a fasting person has two joys. A joy when he breaks his fast, and a joy when he meets his Lord. Wallahi al-Azim, I have a joy when I see my brothers walking through the door. I have a joy, Wallahi, especially after I turn my face after Salah, and we finish the Taraweeh, and we've done whatever we have done, and they're still hanging on. They're still standing behind me. Wallah al -Azim, it causes me to have goosebumps. I love it. This is even an invitation to the brother who went lost and astray throughout the whole year. The Ramadan comes with that invitation to these people. A month of brotherhood. You find that this person doesn't feel any boundaries, he just feels happy to come and join and sit between the bearded brothers, the non-bearded brothers, and sits between everyone, as if he belongs to the whole crew. This is another sign that Ramadan is the month of brotherhood. Even to the weak brothers, even to the brothers who wrong themselves, we will wrong ourselves. Even to the brothers that wrong themselves, you find it's the month of brotherhood. It's the month of invitation to that brother. And all this has only is only a short, a few examples of many examples that can come about from the month of Ramadan. Think about it, my dear brothers, what happens during the month of Ramadan from the bonding between families, between friends and invitations. Think about the day of, the, the, the day of Eid, when everyone is rejoicing and celebrating. Why? Because we won the soccer match, or because probably... Now, uh, we've got our team through and we're up, up the finals. No, no, no. Because we all, alhamdulillah, by the Lord of Allah, so have passed a month and lived a month to see a beautiful, wonderful day in which Allah so just loves it to see you in a state of joy and happiness as Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, where he said that the day of Eid is a day of eating and rejoicing and gratitude to Allah is it is a sign of brotherhood? You see it. You turn around after the salah and you feel like you're part of a big family. You just don't have a, you just don't know where to start and where to finish. You just don't know where to start and where to finish, especially if you're one of those who loves to bond with his brothers. All these are signs, my dear brothers, that Ramadan is an invitation. It's an encouragement to all of us to bond and get closer to each other. Ramadan is the month of mercy. Yes, it's the month of mercy. Why? Because in this month of Ramadan, we can see how we would firstly know that, that there are people who are protected from the fire. And this is the mercy of Allah as a general this individual. In the month of Ramadan, we can see the mercy of Allah as a general. But what I have mentioned from the brotherhood and from the unity that happens between the Muslims, Ramadan is the month of mercy because it is the month of the Qur'an in which the Qur'an is recited in it frequently and more often than the norm. It's more often than the norm. Even the Salaf al-Salih would finish it more. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he had an occasion when he would finish Ramadan, Ramadan the Qur'an twice. And 
it will be silent to Jibreel. It's a month where there is an increase in the reading of the Quran, and this is all the mercy of Allah. All this is coming as a mercy to that individual. The Ramadan is the month of mercy because of the amount of sins that are wiped off and washed off your body. That causes the cleaning to your heart. If you perfect your siyam and you, and you make sure that you fast correctly, you will find yourself washed away from your sins. Wallahi al Adim, brothers, washed away in a state as those who have tasted it say and speak about. And of course, we can't testify that his sins are forgiven. He is. But these people who had a joy in that worship, they say it. And, and this is coming from the pious ulama, righteous. One of them was, would say that the feeling that you get, the joy that you get from the worship, it is like being dipped into cold water on a hot, hot day. Cold water and taken out. And you just feel the cold breeze just blowing against your body. He said, this is the joy that I find. Another one he would say, during his worship and his, his enjoyment to his worship, he would come out and say some beautiful words, where he would say, what could anyone do to me? What could any enemy do to me? My God and my paradise is with me in my chest. It's with me wherever I go. If they kill me, it's martyrdom. If they kick me out, it is to reason. And if they isolate me, if they imprison me, they, they have isolated me to worship Allah. So what would they do? One of them, he would say, Wallahi, if the kings know what I am feeling now, they will, and he will say to his friend, he said, if the kings know what I am experiencing right now, they will fight me over with their swords. If the kings of the palaces knew what I am experiencing at this final moment, this is the joy this is the rahmah of Allah Azza wa Jal. We hope and we assume this is the truth about these people. But there is a joy in worship, which is the murder, which is a result of the mercy that Allah Azza wa Jal favors this person with and shadows this person with. One of the Salaf Salah would say, there is a paradise in this world. Whosoever does not enter it will not enter the paradise of the hereafter. Paradise in this world, yes. A real paradise. What is that paradise? It is the paradise of being of those who remember Allah, who obey Allah, who worship Allah Azza wa Jal. There is a sweetness in us, brothers. There is a sweetness in it. There is a joy in it. Even Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, most importantly, he testifies to this. He testifies to the sweetness of Iman. He says to us, when he was at the time of distress and hardship and pain, he would say to Bilal, he would say to Bilal, ya Bilal. Relieve us with the prayer, which shows you that these, there's a, a mercy that descends and there's a joy that overwhelms the individual when he's worshipping Allah Azza wa Jal. Ibn Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, وَجُعِلَ قُرَّةُ عَيْنِي فِي الصَّلَاةِ And the, 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 the pleasure of my eyes, the pleasure of my eyes was made in the salat. The pleasure of his eyes was in the salat. And you'll find Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he would say, ثَلَاثَةٌ مَنْ كُنَّ فِيهِ وَجَدَ حَلَاوَةَ الْإِيمَانِ Three things. Whoever has it, he will find the sweetness of iman. And he mentioned that Allah has told his messengers, more beloved to him than anything else. And don't you fast, my dear brother. Don't you fast. Because, isn't it that you fast because you love Allah and you love His Messenger? This is a joy in Ramadan. This is a mercy from Allah as a upon you in Ramadan. Dear brothers and sisters in Islam, Ramadan is a hunting season. It's a hunting season. If you don't know how to hunt and you're trying to figure it out during Ramadan, then you're going to miss out on a lot of bounties, a lot of rewards, a lot of goodness. 
And if you don't plan ahead what you want to hunt for and what you want to get, you're going to end up with mixed results, good and bad. Ramadan is the month of hunting for more acts of obedience that will bring you closer to Allah. Rasulullah he tells us in the authentic hadith that doing the optionals in Ramadan is equivalent to doing what? The obligation. Doing the optionals in Ramadan is equivalent to doing the obligation. And the obligations are multiplied and multiplied. And this is an authentic hadith. So, the person who is on the hunt, he will realize the increase in the optionals. Why? Because the reward is what that is increased. Increase it more. Okay? It's the time for hunting for the hearts. For Allah so to guide someone on your hand on your hands is better than this world and what it contains. Many people are gonna walk through your doors. Many individuals are gonna walk through your doors. You're gonna see many people throughout Ramadan, you never see throughout the whole year. You're gonna be the hunter that really gets them hooked <laughs> and to love the mosque. And wallahi, it is worse than swearing at a man. It's even worse is when you are the highway robber leading to Allah. What I mean by that, you're the cause why people are blocked away from walking the path to Allah. Why? Because you never ever welcomed and you never ever showed that kindness or goodness where they feel like I am welcome to come and he was the person who led you to Allah. So my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, remember what I'm going to say. Ramadan is the month of hunting. Hunting for more acts of, acts of goodness, from worships, from optionals. And it's also the month of hunting for the hearts of people. When you see your child in Ramadan, make sure if it's your brother that you've never seen again, never seen before, and you know you're never going to see him again, make sure you throw your nets. Throw your nets and see what you'll come back with. Be like that man who didn't know what he was doing when he threw the bucket into the well. He came out with a prophet. Took him out of the well unknowingly and was a court. And, and this man, yeah, he wouldn't have reports that he'd be raised as that. But look what he caught. He caught a young child who was a prophet. Yusuf Ali said that. Be like him. But of course, in the right way, where you're doing it to lead your way to a life. You never know, brother, that hook that you throw, what kind of a fish you're going to end up with. But at the end of the day, it's the intention that Allah has so loves to see upon you. It's the good intention. The Salaf of and the pious predecessors, my brothers, they were experts at hunting. Allah, you find some incredible moments from them. I can recall with their dad, or one of the other companions, he was asked by a Jewish man, just to show you with the non-Muslims, he was asked by a Jewish man, is your beard cleaner or the tail of my dog? Look at the hunter. You want to have a go at me? You want to, you want to have a go at me? I'll show you how I'm going to give you a go to you. I'll show you how I'll, give a, I'll have a go at you. He said, if it's clean, if it's in paradise, then it's cleaner than the dog's tail. And if it's a hellfire, no, your dog's tail is clean. It is, is cleaner. Look at the hunter straight away, turn around the moment, and know how to direct it. It's not important that you meet, brother. What, it, what is important is what you're calling for means. Find its way into the heart of the brother next to you. One of the ulama, he was Qadi Wakir. Qadi Wakir. This man. He will pray fashion in Jama'ah. And he will have his circle of knowledge up. And after that, he will go to where the Bedouins, the desert people, gather. And he will go and sit in between them and start teaching them. He was a hunter. He knew where the hunting is going to happen. They're going to be found there. I'm going to go there and I'm going to sit there. The next thing he buds in in a nice way. And his next thing he's got... That will happen. You could be liked it at any time, brother. Even one of the pious predecessors, he would go, one of the Udabah, he would go to where people would go to get their water. 
in the desert still. Why not? One wife. True stories, brothers. And he would he once watched this whole line and said, I've got to take advantage of this. Now look at this mind of a hunter. He said, I've got to take advantage of this. He's come to a pass like this. So what does he do? He puts up a tent nearby. He puts a bit of water, puts a bit of dates, and he yells out to people, whoever wants to drink water and eat dates and be shaded, come to me. Who's not going to go to him? And they will go to him. And then he'll say, look, and now they send an ayah to him. And on their way, subhanAllah, they'll end up memorizing an ayah. And as a result, Allah wa'ala, how many people memorized Quran? Rather be like that. You're going to find his brother walking in. You're going to find your way to really hook him on. Be that little brother. Hook him. Take him on. Don't be pushy, but know how to really make him love the mosque. And if it's to show a beautiful smile, then let it be a smile. It's to show some kindness, let it be kindness. If it's to invite him to iftar, then let it be the invitation to iftar. But let it, be, let it be that you're not a foolish hunter, a blind hunter, but a wise, intelligent hunter who knows how to hunt and where to go. My dear respected brothers and sisters, Ramadan is the month of forgiveness. And this is, this is important in order for true brotherhood to be. <coughs> Allah has so He told us in His glorious book that and they should pardon and forgive. And Allah has so He told us after that do not want do, don't you want that Allah forgives you? The month of Ramadan should be the month in which you're going to clear your heart towards your family, your family members, your angry with them, your brother, your sister, your friends, your whoever it is, clear the hearts from us. Wallah Rabim, true manhood is not in being the man who is always going to prove himself to be right. The person who is going to always prove himself to be right and get his rights is not the real man. The real man is the one who realizes the better of the two goods and the worst of the two bads. The better of the two goods. Yes, I can get my rights. Yes, he's wronged me. But one lucky there's a better thing from all that. And that is to cause a bit of that forgiving in order for Allah to forgive me. And that is great. But be that man who realizes what's the better of the two goods. Allah, your brothers, it hurts to be of those who walk. It hurts me, it hurts you. None of us like to walk around with a hot coal into your heart. It's burning. 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 You want to walk around with a heart that's peaceful. A heart that's cool. A heart that's forgiving. Because wallahi, no one's going to be happier than you at that time and moment, brothers. Abu Bakr al-Sundir had his daughter accused of zina. His daughter was accused of zina. Come on, brothers. Accused of zina. And Allah Azza wa Jal reveals to him, وَلْيَعْفُوا وَلْيَصْرَحُ And let them pardon and let them forgive. Why? That this man at, at a stage was speaking about his daughter. Allah tells him, pardon and forgive. And Abu Bakr al-Siddiq pardons and forgives. That's why he's a Siddiq. And not only that, he gives. Pardons, forgives and he gives. This man he was giving him before he before that problem happened and he continued to give him up. Brothers, this is what I want to see. I want to see this between us all. I want to see some pardoning and forgiving. Be the better of the two. Be the better of the two. No family likes to see two at enmity. No brothers like to see two at enmity. Be the better of the two brothers. You pardon, you forgive. Because at the end of the day, your reward is with Allah. No one can reward you. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, he narrates, he said, that Allah Azza wa Jal will say on the day of resurrection, whoever has a right with Allah, let him go and get it. Whoever has a right with Allah, let him go and get it. Who will stand up? Those who pardon and forgive. They didn't get their rights yet. These people oppressed them and they were better. Not for the sake of being foolish, no, they're not dumb. They're smart, they know what's going on. But they are wise people, they realize what is the best. 
they will rise, they will stand up. And as a result, Allah will forgive them and pardon them. A person in paradise will have an end, a judgment day, two will have enmity. This is unreported. Two who have enmity. One will have a, a problem with the other. He's got a problem with his brother. It will be said, and he's got his rights. He's got a right at 20. Allah Azza wa Jal will say, wouldn't you, he said, would say to this person who has a right, he said, look above. He would look above. And he will see a palace in paradise. He will say, Ya Allah, who is this for? Ya Allah, who is this for? He said, it's for you if you forgive your brother. That's happening on the day of resurrection. Allah Azza wa Jal is paying the price there. And then he will say, take the hand of your brother and walk into paradise. Take the hand of your brother and walk into paradise. This is what we want to see. Brothers, the Salaf were like that even with the criminals. They were not foolish, no. But they realized what's the best to do at each time. It is reported, Ibn Mas'ud once went down to the parking place. And he came to buy something and he had his money tied up <coughs> onto something that he was wearing. So when he came to take his money, he realized it's been stolen. So the people in the marketplace were looking at him. What is he going to do? What is he going to do? He raises his hands and he says, Ya Allah, if he took it because he's in need of it, then bless it. And Ya Allah, if he took it because he had the courage to disobey you then, make it the last sin. Look at the wisdom. He could have made dua on him, but making dua on him will only help the shaitan overcome him and win over him. And the shaitan will win at that moment. This is why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he disallowed the companions from cursing the one who drinks alcohol. Despite the fact there's a hadith that says he's a mal'ul, he's cursed. But he disallowed them when they were cursing an individual wife. When they were cursing an individual wife. So that the kulli shaytani awnan ala akhi. Do not be a helper to the shaytan or be a Muslim brother. Don't be a helper to the shaytan or be a Muslim brother. Another example. This is coming from a great alim. He once took off his turban. Turban is the imam. He took it off after he was, when he wanted to make wudu. So he placed it on the side of the river. <coughs> and while he was doing his wudu, a thief stole his turban. But he was a, 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 a classic. He was a, 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 a fair one. You know, he wanted to leave something in mind. So he left him a cheap one. He gave him the cheap, took the expensive. And he ran off. He pretended he didn't even see, he went and put it on his head and he walked off. He sat in his gathering and the students were all looking at his cheap turban. And this sheikh had an expensive turban. They said it was worth 20 dinars. He was rich. They tell him, one of them said, Ya Sheikh, are you mad? It seems like your amama has changed. Did someone steal it? Did someone steal it? He went quiet. And then he said, Afa Allah wa anna wa anna. May Allah pardon us and pardon him. None of us, brothers, none of us is free from the mistake. Wallahi yakhi, we're not free from mistakes. As much as you see the mistakes in each other, you got a bigger mistake. And wallahi, if we were busy looking at ourselves and correcting ourselves, we realize how much we need to be more merciful towards each other. Because every one of us is filled with so much problems. Every one of us is filled with so many problems. It is reported that Sophia, the wife of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, she once, she had a servant. And this servant of hers spoke about her in a bad way to Umar al-Khattab. Or she said something that was reached, that reached Umar when Umar al-Khattab was Amir al-Mu'mineen, the leader of the believers, the Khalifa. So, what was, she, what, what was it that she said about her? She said that she loves Saturdays and she loves the Jews. So, Umar al-Khattab, he said, uh, he said, he called Sophia, he asked her, 
She said, ever since I became a Muslim, I never loved Saturdays again. And I repl Allah replaced it for me with Friday. And I have relatives from the Jews, because she had a Jewish background, that I connect my ties with. But however, I'm not of those who have my allegiance to them or love towards them that is blind. So Umar Khattab makes dua for her, he says, and he leaves her. He, she realizes later on, Sophia, she realizes that her servant is the one who spoke bad about her to Umar Khattab. So she asked her, why did you do this? She got all scared and she said, a shaitan, a shaitan, a shaitan did this, a shaitan caused me to do this. She said, go, you are free. She could have whipped her, she could have... But the point is, this is where you've got to realize and think, my dear brothers, what's the best of the two? What called the mean and ghayla wal aafina anil nas? And those who repress their anger, and those who pardon people. Those who repress their anger, and those who pardon people. Be of those who are oppressed, and do not be of those who are who oppress others. You be the oppressed, yes. Don't allow for you to be the oppressor. You be the one who forgives and pardons. And do not be the one who just wants to claim all his rights. Because wallah al mean, if you were to be to treated and judged for everything, wallah, we're all doomed, brothers. We're all doomed, we're all destroyed. Why? Because the who of us is free from from mistakes and from shortcuts. Ramadan is the month of brotherhood, it is the month of mercy, it is the month of forgiveness. Let's really make it like that. Let us really make it like that. And let us make it not only like that during Ramadan, but let it be throughout our lives. Let it be that place in which you only get better and better and not stay the same throughout and no change happens to you. I ask Allah so I to make us all live to it. I ask Allah so I to to accept our deeds, to ask Allah to make us of those who are sincere in our worship, to ask Allah to forgive our shortcomings. My dear brothers, if I've said anything that's right, it's from Allah's blessings and His aid. And if I've said there's anything that's wrong, I ask you to uh, excuse that. Because remember, I'm only human, and it's from myself, and I do not claim that Allah is the one who did the wrong, rather, it's myself and the shaitan. And I ask Allah to Give me for that. In the meantime, if you've got any humble questions you can ask, if there are that I can help with, I'm more than happy to answer it if I can, if I know it. Otherwise, I'll just simply leave it and we'll end it next time. Are there any questions, brothers? What do you have? Yeah. Like, since uh, there's no hands up, uh, I do not want to wait for the hands. Are there any questions, brothers? Any, anything at all I'd like to ask you, to ask me? Yes. In other words, can you use toothpaste? Yeah. Well, I have you know, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would use his siwak during the Ramadan. You know what's a siwak, right? And the siwak has a flavor. Okay? And since the siwak was allowed, anything that has a similar taste, as long as it's not swallowed, that would be allowed. But it's better to be cautious. What I mean by cautious, you know, brush your teeth before the pleasure, okay? And be cautious. Not because it's haram, but because this is to stay out of differences of opinion. Does that make sense? But at the conclusion, my belief, my humble opinion that I've taken from Ulama, is that it's allowed, similar to how Siwat would be allowed, while you must. Any other questions for the brothers? Um, if you pray for Ali with your man, yeah. okay, uh, you get the reward of as if you pray the whole night. But that doesn't mean that we can't go on to increase and do more and more. Okay? And in, when it came to acts of goodness and worship, Allah has to he described a special special type of people as a sabiqun, a sabiqun. The red, the one, the, the forerunners, the forerunners, the ones who are ahead and ahead. So Definitely you are recommended to do so. It's not uh, haram. Even if you did pray the wudu. If you prayed the wudu with the imam, for example, okay, 
and you decide later on to pray, you are allowed to. Okay? But it's preferred that if you do know you're going to pray after the wudu with the imam, it's preferred that you join his wudu with another one and delay the wudu till the end of the night. Does that make sense? It's preferred. But if you forget or you decide not to, then there's no problem in praying after it, and that's the most correct view of Allah Ta'ala. Okay? Any other questions for the brothers? Sisters, if you have any questions, you can write on a piece of paper and I'm more than happy to assist you. Um, Plate. We'll give a few, few more for the brothers. Any more questions at all? Plate. Where did he ask? Hanat Allah Ta'ala wa bihamdi, Tashadu Allah, 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 and Blessed of the Lord, and 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 the Lord,